Amen. So John chapter 6. You know, two weeks ago, I thought we were going to be done with John chapter 6. That didn't really work out for us, did it? It would be a miracle. Um, so, last week, we... We were talking, uh, we spent most of our time uh, looking at the miracles of Christ, uh, really, not necessarily the miracles, but just since we had come off of him feeding the 5,000, just a, a side detour in proving uh, those miracles, and there were two specific things uh, that we looked at, two different criteria. Does anybody remember what they were? The two miracles? Well, no, he did more than two miracles. The two criteria on examining his miracles. Remember the first was the criteria of embarrassment and how they were saying they would say negative things uh, about him or about the apostles for example after he was crucified and you know they tried to bribe the guards to say well just say that his apostles you know that they stole the body. And so the criteria of embarrassment is if you are wanting to put someone in the most positive light, why would you include anything, as far as a writing is concerned, why would you include anything that would give a non-believer an excuse to not believe? And part of the reason for that is the only reason to include it is if it's true. And if you are trying to be, uh, you know, transparent, uh, as, uh, as our government likes to say. Uh, the second thing was also the criteria of outside texts, uh, essentially looking at writings outside of the Bible, generally by those that are uh, called the early church fathers, um, have uh, Tacitus, Irenaeus, and several others, because they were closer to the time. And the biggest one, uh, or one of the biggest ones that we looked at was Josephus, because Josephus he was a non-Christian Jewish historian who identified with the Pharisees. And he was uh, not alive uh, during the time of Christ. It, it, was, it was after uh, he had been taken as slave. He had nothing to gain, and yet in his writings, uh, he said about this time there was a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. So here we have a non-Christian who is still taking from eyewitnesses recording that Christ did these wonderful works. Whereas, if he wanted to, he could just have left that out. And, and we know, of course, from uh, the texts, uh, you know, John chapter 3, for example, with Nicodemus, he says, we know that you're from God because no one can do the works that you do. So... Sadducees, scribes, Pharisees, Christians, when they, were, when they became Christians, non-Christians outside, you know, in history, they all still identify Christ not only as a historical figure, but one who was able to do miraculous things. And so that's where we left off, and then we're picking up with verse 38 of John chapter 6. But did anybody have any questions, comments, or insights uh, regarding what we looked at last week? Okay, then. So beginning in verse 38, just reading through verse 40, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. That, all, uh, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So you think of a lot of people during that time, he, when they were looking at the Messiah, and we've discussed this before, they were looking at someone in a very physical way. Just in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, where, he said, where, they're question, where they're recalling a question to Christ, and they ask, will you now restore the kingdom 
uh, of God to Israel. They were looking for a political leader, a military leader, and what have you. And, and so it can be, well, what is the will of the Messiah? What is the will of God? We even at, we ask that question today, and people are going to ask it until, uh, you know, Christ comes back. You know, what is God's will for me? Right? And they were asking this of the Messiah as well, and he says, this is the will of, of him who sent me. Now, he's already said, I came from the Father. So this is the Father's will, right? That everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on that last day. The unfortunate thing with, with this particular text is that's where a lot of people stop. Okay, well, he says everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So that's all you need to do. So they take out everything else. They take out baptism. They take out uh, repentance and, and what have you. And, you know, in uh, English literature, it's called a synecdoche, uh, which is, it's a piece that represents the whole. Right? This is just one part of the entire plan of salvation, if you want to call it that. Right? Uh, we know there's hear, believe, repent, and confess and be baptized, and, and what have you. And it was simplified in those five steps by Walter Scott during the re Restoration period. So, so many people stop there. And Jesus, he, it does contain, verses 37 through 40, this, this explanation of the process of personal salvation. And, and they really are some of the most profound words that he ever spoke, because he's explaining... Uh, salvation, that it involves both a divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Um, you know, the Father gives men and women to the Son, right? Now, this is where it gets a little, little hairy, I guess, I guess you might say, um, because it starts leading into uh, Calvinistic doctrines of irresistible grace, uh, and basically the way the text would look to a Calvinist is, okay, God gives to the Son, you can't resist that. If you're going to the Son, if you're going to Christ, that's not your will. That's God's will. That, that's, what the, that's what the Calvinist says. And, the, uh, and, and it is somewhat difficult well, it's easy if you're only looking at these particular verses, but when you're looking at the whole of Scripture, you, you see everything. So it's that the Father gives men and women to the Son. He says it in verses 37, 39. He says it in John chapter 17. Um, he says it in several different places. But the men and women must come to him. And he assured them that nobody who came to him would ever be lost, but would be raised on that last day. Now, he says that everyone who beholds the Son, verse 40, and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on that last day. So some will take that to conclude that you cannot fall from grace, if you will, right? The once saved, always saved idea. Well, the question then becomes, if you still have to come to Christ, can you not also leave Christ? Does that make sense? If you have the free will to come to Christ, then logically speaking, you also have the free will to leave Christ. And we see Paul writing of various people in Timothy who did that. It is the Father's will that, that sinners are saved and those who trust and obey Christ will be in their salvation um, or will be secure in their salvation. Now, when I say secure in their salvation, that's a continued obedience. I know that y'all probably know that here, but for the sake of those who, who, may, be, uh, who may be watching the video later, in trusting, when I say trust in Christ, it is a belief in Christ, it is a faith in Christ. I am not talking sinner's prayer or, or anything like that. Any thoughts? Do I need to clarify? Are y'all awake? Okay. 
So he goes from there and he, and he says, verse 40, this is the will of my father. Everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life and I myself will raise him up that last day and leads into, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him. So for this reason, they were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came out of heaven. Now, the John, he explains the reaction of the Jews, that they began to grumble about him because he said he's the bread that came down from heaven. This is actually the first place in chapter 6 where it's mentioned that they are Jews. Prior to, prior to this verse, verse 41, um, they're referred to as the crowd, uh, uh, in verse 2, 22, 24, or the people, as we see in verses 10 and 14, or as they, or them. Here it's very clear that he's talking about the Jewish people. Um, they're the ones that were grumbling against him. Now, we know from previous texts in John, if I can turn over here, if my pages will stop sticking together on me, You know, in John chapter 1, verse 5, for example, or verses 4 and 5, it says, In him, talking about Christ, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You know, he came into the world, but they did not receive him. A prophet is not welcome in his own country, we, we would read. And it's all from the Jewish people. Now, earlier, the crowd, uh, in verses 33 and 34, they appeared to just kind of pass over his claims to have come down to heaven because they were interested in the bread that he promised. Uh, but the Jews, now realizing that the bread Jesus offered wasn't physical bread, they started to take offense to that, and they start grumbling about it, just as their Israelite forefathers had done. If we went back to, I believe it's Exodus chapter... 16. Yeah, for example, uh, Exodus chapter 16, this whole section dealing with the Lord provides manna, verse 2, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And they start, um, you know, talking. The sons of Israel said to them, would we uh, would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you brought us out to this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, you think about this idea, we have that he fed these 5,000 men, uh, plus women and children, again, conservative estimate around eight to 9,000 people, and they followed him over to Capernaum. Remember, he, he sent the disciples ahead of him in a boat. They go out. He disperses the crowd. A great storm rises up. He walks out. He, he calms the sea. They end up at Capernaum. He's teaching in the synagogues, and this is what he's teaching. We, we remember that uh, from, well, verse 59, which we haven't gotten to. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So he's teaching them there, and these people, when they realize that it's not physical bread that he's talking about, they get upset, very much like their forefathers did back in the wilderness. Hey, over in Egypt, we sat by pots of meat, we had bread, we could eat our fill, and you've brought us out here to die. So you think about it is you have these 5,000 plus people, let's say some left, and we'll drop it down to, I don't know, 2,000. Uh, just a, a guess, pull a number out of the clouds. And now, did you bring us here to die? You know, you're, you're not going to give us a, actually any bread? And so they were saying, verse 42, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say now, I have come down from heaven? So these Jews who grumble, they're either the synagogue congregation of Capernaum, or, or at least its leaders, but their grumbling shows them the same spirit displayed by their fathers in the wilderness, the, the man who was provided. Um, but the Jews in Jerusalem, they were, in, they were really incensed because they recognized that Jesus 
said things that put him on an equal footing with God. Now, that's something you did not do. You could say a whole lot of things, but you do not say that you are on equal footing uh, with God at all. And they were Galilean Jews. Um, they know this fellow Galilean, and they become upset with, with his claims. It, it's not so much the, the claim of, uh, to be bread that offends them. It's the claim that he is the bread from heaven, right? Does that make sense? It's not so much that he's talking about bread. It's that he's saying, God sent something. God sent me. I am the one that you need. That's, that's what upsets them. So they turn and they say, wait a second here. Isn't this son of Joseph, son of Mary? We, we know this guy. You know, several of them probably. It's not a heavily populated area when there's no feasts going on. But we know this guy. How is it that he's saying the bread of heaven? So, of course, there, there's some backbiting there. And, um, you know, how could this be? His family it, had moved to Capernaum. He was known there. And in fact, over in Mark, let me see here, Mark chapter 6, yeah, Mark chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, there's really the, the, same, uh, the same kind of issue. Beginning in verse 2 of Mark 6, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him, and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Again, criteria of embarrassment. That they're admitting that he performed miracles. No one, no one denied that. Um, is, this, uh, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So throughout the scriptures, uh, we have them accusing and saying, he can't be from God. We know this guy. He's just like, he's just like everyone else. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's very similar to the distrust that Moses first had when he returned. Uh, remember him being brought up by Pharaoh's daughter and in the house of Egypt, and he slays an Egyptian. Uh, all the people knew who he was. He slays an Egyptian. He he runs away, but then he comes back, and it's wait a second. We know who you are. We know that you were raised by Egyptians. We know what you did. Who who? Why should we believe you? How can we believe that you were sent by God? when all of this time you were lording over. It's very, much, very similar to the same claim here. How can you say that you're the bread from heaven, that you're sent by God, when, uh, when we know you're just a carpenter, right? Um, Jesus, of course, he was the legal son of, of Joseph, uh, not his natural son, uh, being born of a virgin. I know we mentioned that last week. So they identified Jesus at Nazareth of Galilee, not Bethlehem in Judea. And they thought that Joseph was his natural father, right? Um, ha, remember when Mary was found to be with child, Joseph had a mind to do what to her? They had to put her away, right? So in not putting her away, he's not only doing what God had commanded by the angel, you know, of, don't worry about it, take it, this, she's a child of God and, and all this. But it, later, there's a repercussion of that in that they believe Joseph to be his natural father, right? Um, but the, if they had investigated the matter, then they would have learned who Jesus, you know, really is. All they had to do was ask mom, you know, and ask some others at, at the time. But of course, uh, and she could have easily told them the same account that we read about in the genealogy of Jesus Christ and the birth narrative. Of course, they wouldn't have believed her uh, either. 
Um, even in the days of Moses, again, the Jews, they were known for their murmuring. Perhaps a leader, some of the crowd, they had moved in the synagogue to continue discussion. The main issue is, where did he come from? And five times, five times in this chapter, Jesus says in one way or another, or it's recorded one way or another, that he came down from heaven. Either him saying it directly or his detractors repeating what he had said to them. Any thoughts or, or comments? Do what? Take a drink, Take a drink anyways. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, at least I'm not leading songs after class. <laughs> so Jesus, he says in verse 43, he answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the, the last day. So Jesus says, Stop grumbling. Uh, among yourselves. And it, it's, it's interesting also that he goes back in verse 43, he tells him to stop grumbling in verse 44, he goes back to what he had said in verse 40. Uh, you know, the, you come to, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So, showing that he's not surprised by their rejection. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, in the Old Testament, God drew people by what we refer to as bands of love. B-A-N-D-S, bands of love. Does someone mind reading Jeremiah uh, chapter 31 and verse 3? And if someone else could read Hosea... Uh, 11 and verse 4. So Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. And then Hosea 11 and verse 4. Okay, 11 and verse 4, please. Thank you. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Thank you. So, in the Old Testament, we refer to those as bands of love, that, because that, that's really how the text reads, and that's how God drew people to himself, right? Here, the Father draws people to the Son... And unless he does so, no one can come to him. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. Now, viewed from, viewed from the human perspective, viewed from the human perspective, all may come to Jesus and believe in him and, in fact, are required uh, to do so. He mentions that in uh, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, they said to him, what do we do that we may uh, work the works of God? Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom... Uh, he has sent. So required to do so, viewed from the divine perspective, only those drawn by the Father can come and put their faith in Christ. Right? Now, there's another perspective found elsewhere that, that we're not going to get into. But, and we're going to get into this drawing people uh, a little bit more as well. Concerning those whom the Father draws to him, Jesus said, I will raise him up at the last day. And, in, so, and in John's gospel, or this account, um, Jesus speaks frequently of the last day. For those who believe their resurrection on the last day, the consummation of everything that Scripture has talked about. But for those who don't accept his word, it, it's really a day of reckoning. We go over to, let me see here, uh, John 12 and verse 48, for example, uh, Jesus says uh, in John 12, 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. 
So he speaks throughout the text, and that was John 12, 48. But he speaks throughout the text about the last day, and for those who come to, come to him, come to Christ, drawn by the Father, for them they will be raised up the last day. But the last day for the unbeliever is, is a day of reckoning. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Hmm? Right. And, and, and that's what I was saying before, is if we just stick with, let's say, just this chapter, these few verses, and there are other places in Scripture as well, that if you just stick with those little nuggets then it comes, it's what we have now, the doctrine of predestination, right? Where, I mean, we're reading this, and it's like, okay, I need to come to Christ, but Jesus said that God is the one, one that draws people to Christ. Well, even if we look, for example, over in Acts chapter 2, um, you know, Peter's recorded sermon, you know, we all love that chapter. And again, my pages are sticking together. Ah. Well, let's see here. Okay, so we quote, we most often quote of chapter 2, verse 38. Right? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But then look at verse 39. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So, in looking at it, if we just did with verse 39, just as if we just took a few verses here, yeah, that's predestination. But like a lot of things, they'll teach, pre you know, they'll teach this, but conveniently they skip over verse 38 that talks about being baptized. And so that's why I would say it's just a piece of the whole picture. And, and we are going to look at it more as to how God calls and and what have you. So, uh, so, don't, so I certainly understand anybody reading this text or just someone sitting at home and, and not knowing, you know, how to study the Bible and how to look at things and, and read the Bible. I can see people. Oh, well, I mean, that's, that's exactly what it says. Oh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I mean, no, absolutely. And me personally, uh, it's not going away anytime soon. You know, um, you know, Calvinism, the tulip with total depravity and unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, and once saved, always saved, predestination. It's been around for over 400 years. It's not going away anytime soon, right? Um, that's, that's why there are some things that we, that we certainly fight for because the truth needs to be out there. <laughs> but don't think that they're going, going away in our, our lifetime, you know? I can sit here and preach a sermon against homosexuality, for example, but homosexuality's been around since at least the days of Sodom. It's going to be gone if I die tonight. You know, it'll still be there. So, so we, st we stick with the truth as best as we can. But we are going to look at that because expanding the idea of the Father drawing people to him, Jesus further explains how the sinner can come to God. It's through the truth of the word. So verses 44 and 45, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Okay, now everyone who has heard and learned from the Father. Now how are they going to hear the word of God? Hmm? Yeah. Uh, they're going to hear from the Bible. Now, go over to Romans chapter 10. And this is where we, we have to start tying things. I, I, I realize, you know, that the Bible, it's 66 separate books. You know, we've got 39 in the old, 27 in the new, and everything. But really, it is all one book. So we do have to tie things uh, together. Because, for example, and we'll just, uh, hmm, 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 we'll go ahead and start with verse 11 of Romans chapter 10. There's a couple of things to point out. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. That's, the, that's a quote from the Old Testament. That's New American Standard Bible. Does anyone have anything other than disappointed at the end of verse 11 in Romans 10? Be ashamed, be put to shame. Right? So that's also part of that idea of all I've got to do is believe. Right? Now, let's keep reading verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. And that's true. Romans 1, 16 and 17, it says it's the power of God and the salvation to, uh, you know, all who believe, you know, Jew, Greek, and, and whatnot. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches, for all who call on him, and then verse 13, quoting the Old Testament again, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, and what might that sound like? Sinner's prayer? All, you know, so you've got, all I've got to do is believe, and then we're going to tie that into all I've got to do is say a prayer, call on his name, and, and, and I'll be saved. But then it said, and now we're really kind of getting to the crux of the matter when we're talking about being called by hearing and learning of God. Verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And that preacher is not specifically talking about a man. It's a, a messenger. It's someone proclaiming the word of God, right? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Okay? So when we go back and look at John 6, they shall all be taught of God. And then he says, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Well, Peter, he would later write that there's no prophecy of any private interpretation, but holy men of God were moved by the Spirit to put these things down. Okay? So how are they going to hear from God? From the Bible, right? Right. The, the scriptures say that there is no one who, and it says a few times, there is no one who seeks God, no, not one. And what it's talking about, in a general sense, uh, is there is no one seeking the, the God of the Bible. There's no one seeking the God of heaven, the, the one true God. They, sure, people look for something higher. They look for something outside of themselves. They look for an authority. That's why there are so many false deities and idols that are in the world, because no one is seeking the one true God. How did those people in Acts chapter 2 hear about that one true God? Word of God, the Holy Spirit, it says, you know, they were all, uh, they were all together with one accord. They were in an upper room. The sound of this rushing mighty wind fills the room where they were sitting. And cloven tongues like fire sits on them, and they each began to speak in other tongues or other languages as they were given utterance. So they started, and when you look at that and looking at taking into account Romans chapter 10 and what we read there, the initial church started because they heard people preaching the word of God. That's how they learned about the word of God, and that's how they were taught by the word of God, not only the preaching, but then as these letters, these various epistles start getting out, 
and, and copies are being made. So they're taught of God, they're learning of God. We come to today, and that's how people learn and, and hear about God. The God of the Bible, not Brahman, not Vishnu, or, or anything else. That's how they learn about the God of the Bible, is through the Word. And really, it's, and so it's the Word that calls them. And the quote, uh, the, uh, that he says, they will all be taught of God, that's actually from Isaiah uh, chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13. All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. Um, there's also uh, from Jeremiah. Uh, now, that, that's, that part in, in Isaiah 54, that's part of a longer passage having to deal with Israel and blessings and them being restored from, the, from their Babylonian exile. But Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, or 33 and 34, uh, read, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I w will forgive their iniquity, and for their, their sin I will remember no more. Now, how is it that they are going to know God? Bible. That's, that's how they learn of it. So when we look at this idea, and, and you know, among all of these blessings is the fact that all your sons will be taught by the Lord. Jesus took this text and he applies it uh, to ministry the, in verses 44 and 45. Everyone who listens to the Father learns from him, you know, and comes to him, will inherit eternal life. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of? Or do I need to clarify? Because I'm getting some confused looks. Go ahead, it's okay. Barry can edit. Yes, no? no. Okay. I, I can't clarify if no one says anything. Basically, it's this. In a nutshell, in looking at verses 44 and 45, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father uh, comes to me. Now, how is it that they learn of God? Through Scripture. Not private inter Peter says not private interpretation, but what God has delivered to them. How have people always learned of the, I'll say the God of the Bible, through Scripture? That's where Romans 10 comes in. And we have people, they can't talk about someone, they can't call on someone whom they have, haven't believed. They can't believe in someone that they haven't heard about. They can't hear unless people are sent. Uh, really, if we were to look at the overall theme, it's about evangelism. That's the overall theme of everything. That's why it's so important for mission works. And mission works do not necessarily include having to go to Russia, you know, the Ukraine, where Gary Workman is, or over here in Tanzania, where some others are. It, it is, but it also includes going to our neighbor going to our, our neighborhood. You know, that is a mission work. Uh, the ladies getting together during the week, that is called what? Mission printing, you know, and to, and to get those booklets out that we have and other congregations have. So an example really is found of, of this confession of Peter. And at that, and we have to look at things through a careful lens. Things in Scripture do not always work the same way that they do in our life, okay? Now, what I mean by that is that, and here's what I mean by that. For example, you take Peter's confession of Christ, right? 
Uh, you know, Jesus stepped to the shores of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I am? So some say you're Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say, you know, John the Baptist. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay? So that was a revelation that he received from God on who Christ was. That's what Jesus says. Flesh and No one else told you about this. God, in some way, don't know how, this is Christ. Peter, this is Christ. We do not receive private revelation today. So that's what I was saying, is that we have to look at it through a careful lens, because not everything that we read in Scripture acts out or manifests the same way in our life today. God is not giving a private revelation, and we're going to go write it on some golden tablets, put it in a book, and have people wear special underwear and become gods later. Okay, little jab at the Mormons. But... We do have everything that we need, and we can learn and be taught of God by God. But there are some people, so does that, does that make a little bit more sense? Because, and and I, it can get complicated and real, you know, a real fine line when trying to explain some of these texts. And that's why, uh, while I do disagree with Calvinism on, on many, many fronts, I at the same time can also understand as to how people can be taken into it, you know? I mean, realistically, how, how easy would it be for me, just in, in y'all reading it, scale of 1 to 10, 10 being, you know, super easy, one being not at all. How easy would it have been for me to just sit there and kind of twist these scriptures a little bit and we have predestination? I mean, I'd say a 10. It's easy to sit there and twist them a little bit and have people think, look, it says all you have to do is believe. You're, don't take my word for it. It says it in your own Bible, you know. Yeah, add a little bit here and there, but yeah, so it, it can it can get a little bit uh, confusing there. So, and it's basically you know the same message that he gave to the paralytic over in John chapter five. Yeah. Verse twenty four. This is paralytic. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. If we just stick with that, if you believe in God, then you're going to believe in the Son. We've already talked about that, right? If you believe, if you, you can't believe in Jesus and not believe in God, you can't believe in God and not believe in Jesus. So if, if you hear what I'm saying and you believe in God, you're going to have eternal life. Here's the, here's the interesting thing that some people won't point out. Some people who will talk about uh, predestination and just the idea of all you have to do is believe... Who does Jesus say that you have to believe in to inherit eternal life? He's not saying Jesus. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Yeah, he's saying God. You don't even have to believe in me. You just believe in God and you have eternal life. So, it's, so when we're reading, it's a very fine thing. We, we have to pay attention to what we're reading. Because some people will say, well, all you have to do is believe. And they'll turn to this and it's, yeah, but he's saying believe in God. I don't have to believe in Jesus. I don't have to believe in the miracles. I don't have to believe in the resurrection. I don't have to believe in the cross. I don't have to believe any of these things. And yet, what did Paul say? If Christ is not risen, then our faith is in vain. 
And everything we preach is in vain. So, when we look at the arguments, and I'm not encouraging us to go out and study Calvinism or, or anything, heaven forbid, but when we're reading scripture, whether it's your daily reading or you're sitting down to study, and you might end up reading less, actually, slow down a little bit and actually see what the text is, is saying. All right? But it, it's basically the, the same thing that he's telling them here is the same thing that he's telling them there. Okay. Um, yeah, we still got a couple of minutes and they're not out yet. So any thoughts or comments or are we clear kind of on that? So those people who hear and learn of God in our day, uh, well, starting at the beginning, it was all preaching. Right? Romans 10, 14 and following. People preaching. They were hearing the word. They were believing. They were being baptized. Today, we hear uh, and we're taught and we learn of God through the scriptures because there is no prophecy of private interpretation. We have from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 everything that God has to say regarding us. Right? The Old Testament, I think it's Deuteronomy 29, 29, I think. Don't quote me on it. Um, it'll say that the secret things belong to God, but those things that are revealed, they belong to us. Right? So there are things that we don't know, but we have everything that we need to know. First Peter 4, you know, all things pertaining to life and godliness. Any thoughts? Or, we'll just stop it right there. Hey, we got from verse 38 up to, and we'll pick up at verse 46 next week.